Okay guys, so thanks for the kind introduction, Dinesh. My name's Jack and last year I was 12 months, old, 12 months ago, I was in your shoes, pretty stressed out about the literature review, but hopefully with some of the advice that Dr. Wallace has given as well as tonight myself and from Shag that um, we'll be able to alleviate some of the stress that's associated with writing it. Um, I should give a dis quick disclaimer before I talk that all the advice that's in contained within these slides is based on my own experiences from doing the BMED SI year. But I have done a quality test and asked a couple of friends also in BMED SI about their tips and tricks from when they did the lit review to validate. But it's a pretty crap sample size of three people. But anyway, we'll do our best. <laughs> uh, can I get a show of hands of how many people are doing like clinical based projects? Oh, no. So quite a few compared to my year. But, so that's really showing. So hopefully, some of the advice I give can be useful for the clinical projects, but I've also tried to keep it as general as possible. So for the guys doing lab-based projects as well, um, hopefully there's one or two points that you can take home from this presentation. Um, and as you know from Dr. Craig Hassard's presentations for pre-clean years about the stress uh, performance curve, and right now during your lit review, you're probably in the red section probably, or very close to it, or in the orange section. Sorry for the talk, we're gonna try and push you into the optimal stress area, so the yellow section. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about the department oral, since that's one of the assessments that will be coming up for you guys very soon. I think in, was it, three weeks or something? So, really close. Um, and the first question you need to ask yourself is, who is your audience? Because that's going to be quite important to know. So, for myself doing the clinical project, I was pretty presenting in front of a group of clinicians. So, it's really worthwhile putting like a clinical vignette at the start of your presentation. So, it shows to your audience how does your project relate to the clinical setting that they are working in? It gets their interest into what you're talking about for the next 10 minutes. Um, so that's worthwhile. Whereas if you're presenting in front of scientists, you might have to um, phrase your, I guess, your presentation a little bit differently. And then you also need to think about what is your key message? What is your take home message you want, I guess, people to get out of your presentation? And often for clinical projects, you're trying to show that there is a research gap, there is limitations in the current literature and you're gonna, your background should really emphasize and lead down to that point. And then you're gonna tell them how your project is gonna address that limitation, essentially. Um, and you should also show how that background matches the aims and hypotheses of your proposed project because there's nothing more distracting to your markers and seeing like, great, you've identified this research gap, but your project doesn't really answer that question, essentially. And that's also something to keep into consideration when you're doing a literature review as well. The next thing to think about with these things, as Dr. Wallace said, is your slide layout. So less text is more um, when you're doing oral presentations and clinicians in particular love figures. So doing animated figures is also very worthwhile. Um, appropriate animation, as Megan said, so graying out text, putting pointing arrows as you're moving through a figure or showing parts of a figure that then slowly and slowly complete as you go through the slide is also really useful. I've already pointed that out before. And as I said, try and keep to one slide per minute for your oral presentation. Think about supplementary slides as well. So um, the classic question you'll often get asked about for your project is, what is your methodology? So really have a slide on your methodology in your backup slides. You're not gonna talk about it in 10 minutes. Um, so have that included. Um, the other thing that my supervisor once told me is like sometimes you, um, as Megan said, in the literature review, there's little red flags where you say like others, other functions and those sort of things. But used appropriately in an oral presentation, you can sort of bait your audience into asking you certain questions. Go, ah, well, this is something that I have preferred earlier. So that's probably one setting where it is appropriate, but don't do it in your literature review. The other major tip, so regardless of anything I say today, this is probably the most important tip, is that if you haven't started writing a literature review, start today, tonight, basically. Because basically, I like to think about the literature review and also your thesis in general as a bit of a marathon. Sounds really daunting at the start. The first five columns sucks so much and you're just going like, why am I doing this? Why did I sign up to do the demon side? But as you get closer and closer to the end, it gets a bit more easier. So I think that's often the first part to overcome. Um, and given that your due date's in less than four weeks, I'd really get onto it. And as Megan said at the very end, back up, back up, back up. So what I did in my years, have a saved version on Dropbox or some cloud service that you might use, have a saved version on two different USBs, in case things go to crap. 
Um, and then the version that you're actually working on, like as you're updating and working on every day, keep that on like your desktop computer. And every time you do any major changes, save it across those three meetings. So if you run into trouble, like someone steals your computer, Dropbox decides to close down tomorrow, or you lose your USB, you have some form of getting back your lit review. The next thing I'd say is to have a plan. So, you know, having a timeline is really important. And if you haven't already, you should be meeting your supervisor to discuss what that timeline looks like. So something that I did last year was using something known as a Gantt chart. It's basically a fancy timeline. And you sort of group it into various categories. So different assessments that you have to do during BMSI, things related to your project, so patient recruitment, ethics approval, when you're going to stop recruitment, when you're going to start to do the statistics, any other personal equipment, like commitments like holidays or um, you're going away for some other reason or there's a wedding on. And then also putting in your, the dates that your supervisor has told you that they're going to be on leave. Um, so that's really important to have. So it gives your supervisor a clear understanding of when you're going to meet the deadlines and when they can expect for you to submit parts of them to read. Okay. <laughs> The next slide is to have a structure, of course. So Megan's already highlighted one structure of how to do it. And this is just literally me pulling it out from my own literature review. So starting off with, there's a pretty standard structure, starting with background, of course. Your literature should start off broad and become more specific. Chapter four is pretty important. So your knowledge gaps are highlighting, like, the, like I guess, the limitations of the existing literature. So this is where you raise all those discrepancies and saying, like, how the current literature is kind of limited and there needs to be more research into that area. And that's where you sort of summarize the conclusion of why your project's so important. Um, and then your appendices should include all the um, basic preliminary stuff for your project as well. Uh, remembering obviously headings and subheadings. And a really important point as well is to look at some of the examples on Moodle, because these are people that have scored very well for their literature reviews. The other thing that's worthwhile asking is if your supervisor has had previous students, if you can have access to their work. And often um, those students are more than happy to share their work. So you can see particularly what's the standard that you need to aim for. Because more often than not, your supervisor will pick the same expert examiner in that area as well. The other thing is to ask your supervisor, would they prefer you to send it all at once, which is what my supervisors preferred, or do you want them to be sent in sections? And I think um, one of the things that is quite daunting with the literature review is you might say, oh, I've been finished reading all the relevant articles, I'm not ready to start it yet. But if you have your subheadings and headings already ticked off and approved by your supervisor, and as you're reading through all your articles, you can go like, oh, that's a really interesting point. Or, that article is really good for this particular section. So then you put a dot point under that heading, you put the little reference with EndNote, and you can put it word for word then, but then obviously when you're writing the final draft, make sure you paraphrase it, write in your own words, write any comments about this particular um, study, saying like, oh, you know, they had these limitations or, you know, small sample size, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, those dot points will eventually form paragraphs of each of your sections. So that's one approach you can do with the literature review. When you're thinking about looking at articles, of course, you can have a look at who wrote it, when it was published, what was the aims and conclusions of those studies, thinking about the methodology. So does the methodology of that paper actually um, make sense to answer that particular question. And it's also important to think about the limitations, not only the ones that are specified in the article, but thinking about for your clinical question. So for instance, in my study, um, a lot of the existing literature is very limited in the ED setting. All of these studies were based on inpatient, um, inpatient children or children who underwent very invasive testing. So thinking about how this study was had limited applicability in the setting of my project was a particularly important point to raise. Um, and then thinking about extracting it, of course, so this is the part where you go making comments about like, oh yeah, it's a great study, a bad study, why, why not? And these are the points that you raise with your supervisor if you're a bit unsure about like, what do you think about this article? I'm not too sure. What are the limitations? And this is where you can get great feedback from your supervisors about this. Uh, this point's already been discussed at length um, by Megan, but these are some important points when you're writing your literature review. Think about abbreviations, using them sparingly, but if you're going to use them, use ones that are actually established in the literature. So obviously CRP, most people would understand to be C-reactive protein in the clinical setting. Don't be making up new abbreviations because, yeah, it just confuses everyone essentially. The other thing is obviously sentence length. So if your sentences are going beyond three lines on your Word document, split it up, break it into two sentences essentially. 
And as Ning said, your storytelling, so your conclusion should answer what your introduction says, which should make sense from that regard. Um, and use clear language as well. So don't use convoluted things like male pediatric patients when you can just simply say boys. Um, past history is a very redundant phrase because of course history is always in the past. Um, so thinking about these sort of terms, just add to your word limit. Um, they make you sound really smart, but then your examiners are very concise on the point writers. So make sure you don't do that. And the other thing as well is to think about your 50 friends or friends in other year levels. Like your 50 friends are all pretty relaxed right now, apart from being on really long days, but you know, job applications haven't started yet, so it's worthwhile recruiting them to ask them to review your actual literature review, to say, hey, do you mind just reading over the grammar or the spelling of my thing? Does this make sense to you? And then they can say, you'd be nicely acknowledged in my declaration of contributions as well. So um, yeah, it makes sense. And it's also reassuring as well to go like, wow, I spent like three or four months writing this like really, really long document my supervisor, I'm not really sure if they spent enough time reading, make sure the grammar and spelling is right. Hopefully having a third or fourth person read it, you go like, yep, it makes sense to me. I'm not going crazy. So that's really important to think about. And how many of you guys have actually used EndNote or some citation program? Put your hands up if you're using it now. Great, I'm a bit concerned there are a few people who aren't using EndNote yet or some citation program because there was definitely a couple people in our cohort that did not use EndNote for the whole BMSI year, and that caused a lot of grief and caused a lot of pain and agony. So please, EndNote is your friend, but you need to make sure you treat them well, because if you don't treat them well, then EndNote will cause you lots of grief and anxiety. And the number one tip I must say is that when you're actually writing your document, please make sure that you use it in unformatted citations. So if you go to your tab on Word, EndNote X7, click Convert to Unformatted Citations. The reason why is that if you try to remove a citation when it's auto-formatting and auto-updating when you add a new citation, there's a lot of behind-the-scenes text encoding that you're, that's still left over every time you do that. So eventually, if you're like me, you're well into your, at the end of your literature review, and then it crashes and you go, oh, crap. So this is why I recommend this in particular. Um, it also saves you time as well, because every time you add another reference, add another reference, add another reference, you always say it will update the whole document, and it saves you from doing that while you're working. It's so easy, and you won't cause any grief as you're doing the thesis as well. Make sure that your EndNote library is saved to a local drive while you're doing this. Don't use an EndNote library from a cloud service, because that can cause you a lot of trouble as well. And it's really easy to get the actual EndNotes or the reference from what your articles. Just go to PubMed search up the document essentially, and then download it to your citation manager, very easy. Remember to add and remove references using the add and delete function, so it clears out all the coding that goes behind the scenes. Um, obviously ask, when you're sending to your supervisor's review, make sure you convert it to plain text, so you've updated it while being converted to plain text. The reason why is that you don't want to cause your supervisors any grief, because they might like, like do track changes and remove certain references, and if it keeps crashing them while they're doing that, then you know maybe they get really annoyed and won't actually read your article properly. So you want to cause them as minimal stress as possible. Um, and finally, of course, make sure you check the PDF after you've converted it to that form to make sure things haven't gone really nilly um, and those sorts of things. So that's all the things I had to say today. Good luck with everyone. Good luck with writing your literature review, everyone. And does anyone have any questions at all? Cool. Do you have any thoughts or, yeah? Oh, yeah, so I sent them to Nash. Yeah, of course. Um, if you have any other questions in the meantime or you think about them later, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll try my best to get back to you on a timely basis. Thanks, guys.